Hi, and welcome to the Thai Law Forum. Today, I'll be talking with book author Jake Needham. Uh, Jake, thank you for joining us today. Happy to go. Thanks for asking me. Great. Okay, so to begin, you started out in law, uh, then you went to work for American Cable Television, and then you eventually started writing novels full time. At what point in your career did you say, I want to be a full time writer? Well, actually, it didn't happen quite that way, if I can, uh, can redo the chronology okay. slightly. I was uh, practicing law, and uh, it's actually sort of a weird story, but in the middle of a merger and acquisition deal, uh, it was sort of falling apart, and I found myself uh, owning a, uh, a broken-down cable television production company in, mm. in the U.S. Uh, production companies very seldom do the networks produce them themselves. and. Back when I was doing it, at least 20 years ago, it was a pretty lucrative business because it was sort of like contract manufacturing in the uh, in the film business. And I ended up doing that. And so we sold films to Showtime, HBO, uh, Lifetime, uh, USA was a big customer, that sort of thing. And so I was writing full time really then because we mm -hmm. were so cheap and we had so few people around, I ended up writing most of the screenplays uh, myself. So I've really been writing for our Geez, I don't know, nearly 25 years, something like that. What about your novels, though? When did you first get into that and say, I want to start writing actual books? Um, that was about, let's see, I wrote The Big Bango, jeez, uh, about 12, 13 years ago now. Mm -hmm. I, mostly because, uh, you know, it sounds like a bit of a joke, but I, I just discovered I didn't really like movies very much. Mm -hmm. um, and writing screenplays uh, can be... Um, it can be torture after a while, to be honest, because it's not real writing. It's sort of outlining writing, and everybody's dog is involved, and you're constantly in meetings, editing and trying to please people and changing things that you don't think should be changed. So I sat down one day uh, uh, there in Bangkok and decided, well, hell, I'll see if I can write a novel one, and having no idea how to do it, none whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wrote one, and it worked out pretty well, and I've been doing it ever since. Practicing international law, I'm sure that's influenced your writing a bit. Uh, do you think that this has been more of an intentional thing or maybe subconscious? I remember a, a friend of mine once, uh, uh, another writer, was asked by a, a fan how long it took him to write uh, a particular novel, and his answer was, all my life, lady, all my <laughs> life. And, and I think there's an inevitability to that. You put what you are and what you have become, and and what you have lived into your books, maybe not sort of consciously to sit down and say, uh, I'm going to even the score with that son of a gun who screwed up my deposition by, uh, by putting it into a book, but the sum total of your experiences come out, and, and I, I had some really nice reviews from CNN once in which they talked about the authenticity of the books, mm. and, and that it reminded them of a lot of things that well, was true. Uh, the Wall Street Journal had a great line once about uh, about it seeming that much of this was true, and <laughs> that's because it is. I mean, you put it in different people's mouths, and you put the lines of dialogue somewhere else, and you change it around a little bit, but uh, yeah, a lot of it's true. Okay, and what about American uh, cable television? That Has that influenced your writing at all? Only to remind me that I don't want to write screenplays anymore. <laughs> okay. As I said before, it's, it's, it's torturous, because everyone makes a great deal out of the fact that, that screenplays are, are what people love to call in this warm and fuzzy way, a collaborative effort. And all that really means is after you have finished one, 16 people who have no idea what the hell they're doing sit down mm. in a room and tell you what's wrong with it. Mm. Uh, and it's just not fun. Uh, you make obscene amounts of money, uh, but it's just not much fun. And the only writing novels is great fun. You make absolutely no money, so I guess that's the trade off. Why did you choose to set your novels in Asia? Um, I, I don't, I don't you know, I've never asked me that before. I don't really think I chose it. I think it sort of chose me, that uh, you you look at what's in the air around you and uh, and, and you make up some stories, and, and I don't know if I'd be any good writing about two kids and a pregnant elephant in North Carolina. <laughs> uh, you write about what you've experienced and what you see around you and what you feel around you. Okay. And do you think that readers are more interested when the book has been set in Asia as compared to maybe California? <laughs> No, in fact, I think they're much less interested. Uh, yeah, look around next time you're in an American or an English bookstore and, and, and see how much fiction you see that has an Asian background, and the answer is going to be damn near none. Mm -hmm. uh, American publishers would tell you that, uh, that nobody here wants to read about Asia. Um, I don't think that's right, but as a practical matter, if you don't make available 
uh, fiction with an Asian background, then pretty soon you can prove absolutely that nobody buys books with an Asian background. Mm -hmm. uh, I hear from a lot of fans who, who constantly ask me who else they can read, where can they get other fiction like this? They spent a great time in Bali or, or Tokyo or, or their brothers in China or you know, all sorts of things like that. And, mm -hmm. and how Sweden became so damned important and we have so many mysteries set in Sweden, uh, I, not quite clear, but the publishing industry is set at about 30 square blocks of Manhattan and 10 square blocks of London. Mm -hmm. And what they decide is cool is by definition cool. And I have to tell you, Asia is about the most uncool place on the face of the earth. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that uh, uh, I, I hear from a lot of fans, but publishers will simply tell you, no, no interest at all. What do you like most about living in Thailand? Um, you know, to be honest, not much anymore. Fifteen years ago, I loved it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think, uh, I mean, if you've read the Jack Shepard novels, you see that over time, Shepard's view of Thailand changes fairly dramatically. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that's natural because it reflects my own. But maybe 15 years ago, there was there was something extraordinarily nice there for, for a Westerner. It was... Uh, uh, you know, Shepherd's line was something to the effect that uh, my Ben Lai was the national motto, and how can you resist that? Mm -hmm. I've heard a lot of glib explanations by foreigners who think they understand Thailand about why it's different now and why it will never be the same again. And I don't, I don't really think the, the subject lends itself to some sort of glib explication, but the, you know, the fact is it is different, and, and we are perceived differently, and, and the, the position, the role of the Westerner in Thailand is now much different. And, it's just not a hell of a lot of fun anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And so we probably spend much more time in the States now than we do in Thailand. And what about your personal experiences? Have those influenced your book and have you put a lot of them into the novels, but maybe just changed a few things? Uh, yeah, in the, uh, in the beginning of uh, the new novel, A World of Trouble, it, it was so parallel to so many things which, which do seem true that I, I finally was persuaded by the publisher to put a note uh, in the beginning which says uh, basically, uh, hey friends, don't, don't call me up and tell me that my view is not right. I make this stuff up. Mm -hmm. uh, this, is, this is fiction. But I also included in that note an anecdote um, which is, I, I've often thought back on uh, an acquaintance of mine, a friend maybe, who uh, uh, served with uh, the U.S. government in a capacity which we will not discuss, now retired. Okay. And I was sitting around at a bar one night talking about uh, a number of things, and, uh, and he asked me about uh, something that I had in one of the novels, how I found out about that. And I, I said, well, you're right, I, I didn't find out about it, I made it up. Mm -hmm. He said, no, 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 really, Kevin, you can tell me the truth. How'd you find it? And I said, no, I made it up. And he kind of shook his head after a while, and he said, you know, that's something about being in Asia. You can't make anything up. <laughs> because whatever you think you've made up, one of these days somebody's going to come up to you and either tell you it's true, it really happened, or it's about to happen. And that's mm -hmm. sort of my experience with the, the stuff that I, I have made up. And that's why I think uh, contemporary Asia is a really fertile ground for the kind of stuff that I write. Do you do much research for your books or do you just wing it? Um, you know, I. I, I I suppose I draw mostly on my own experience, but of course one's memory is always faulty and you want to check on things, and, mm -hmm. and I find that I'm constantly flipping over to an internet browser while I'm typing just to check on the spelling of a name or the year that something happened, but in the sense of sitting down and doing research in advance, no, not at all. I, I draw on, on some bloodline which draws on something I have lived or remembered, and uh, uh, and that's uh, that. That really works for me. It's the old. Uh, I don't know what magazine was it? One of the business magazines in Hong Kong once said that I knew where the bodies were buried. Mm. To which my answer was, I sure as hell ought to, because I buried enough of them. <laughs> What's the most difficult thing about being a writer then? Um. Well, it's hard work. I mean, I, I think one of the things that, that uh, annoys every uh, professional writer is that inevitably at parties or dinners or, or when you meet fans or that sort of thing, there is some joker who says, you know, I always wanted to write a book. I just never had the time. Mm. Now, if you parse that a little bit, the subtext is you can write a book because you got nothing better to do. <laughs> 
I, maybe it comes from my experience uh, practicing law, but I'm a pretty workaday guy. I go to work at nine in the morning, I work until six, I knock off, I come home. I don't write at night, I don't get up at three o'clock in the morning and write. Mm -hmm. It's a job. You show up, you do your job, uh, you put in the words, and at the end of the day, you've got the words you wanted, and at the end of you know, 90 or 120 days, you've got a book. Mm -hmm. and then you, you go back and edit it. Uh, it's, it's not something that, uh, it's work. I don't know how else to put it. The John Gregory Dunn uh, uh, had a wonderful line, which was that, um, that writing novels was manual labor of the mind. It was like laying pipe. You dug mm -hmm. a ditch and you laid the pipe and then you filled the ditch in again. And sometimes that's the way it feels. And truth is, uh, that's the hardest part about it. Okay. Then what's the most rewarding part about being an author? Uh, the best part in the world is when you sit there late at night and you light a cigar and you look up at your bookshelf and there are four or five or six or a dozen books which you wrote and the spines are looking out at you and you say to yourself, those are going to be there forever. Mm -hmm. That someday my grandson, who I will never meet, is going to give those to your son and say, you know, your granddad wrote those. I think that's just cool in the sound. A World of Trouble, okay, that deals with civil war. Uh, killing Plato, there are murder attempts. Uh, in the big Mongo, you have got the CIA, missing money, criminals, etc. Do you think it takes a certain kind of person to write about these rather dark stories? <laughs> you mean like me? Um, <laughs> I think the honest answer to that question is that I don't see those as dark stories. Okay. I see those as real backgrounds. That, that for me, an engaging novel... I, let me back up. Writers write what they read. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're capable of doing anything else. I couldn't write Harry Potter. I don't read Harry Potter. I know what it's all about. It makes no sense to me. Mm -hmm. I write the same kinds of novels I read. And, and to me, the kind of novel I want to read is a small-scale story set against a large-scale background. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the Jack Shepard novels, they're very much about Shepard coming to terms with who he has become since he chucked his Washington oil practice and on a whim ended up living in Thailand, mm -hmm. and they're about small-scale conflicts and small-scale alliances, but they're played out against these very big backgrounds, and the backgrounds are real. Uh, fiction's about conflict, uh, you know, getting up in the morning and having a nice cup of coffee on a pleasant day, and that's not a story. The story is when you drink the coffee and it's got poison in it, or, or something awful happens, mm -hmm. and I think the reason people love crime novels is because crime is, in most ways, the ultimate conflict. Now, in romance novels, you have, you know, the romance relationship and that kind of thing, but, mm -hmm. okay, come on, I don't read those. It's, it, it, you try to develop conflicts between characters mm -hmm. in a way that illuminates who those characters are and the world in which they live. And so I think it's natural that, that those conflicts play out against these very large scale and sometimes not very pleasant backgrounds. A world of trouble plays out against taking the kinds of upheavals that Thailand has experienced and extending them out a little further. What happened if that really was being on the brink of a civil war? What happens if certain people know things which might prevent that from happening? And, and so you develop stories that way. And those are the stories I like to read. Um, so I guess that's why I wrote. So then what's next for you? I um, have a new book coming out uh, probably December, it all goes well, uh, but there are a lot of moving parts in, in getting a new novel launched. This one uh, is called The Umbrella Man, mm -hmm. and it's the second of the Inspector Samuel Che novels. Inspector Che is a, uh, a CID detective in Singapore who's not really sure he likes being a detective, and even less sure he likes being a Singaporean, okay. but he's a pretty good detective. and. Uh, when I did The Ambassador's Wife, it was really as a bit of a lark to get away from the Shepherd books. But I got so much mail, and so many people seemed to fall in love with Sam Tay. I mean, hell, I got uh, marriage proposals for him from, from people, especially in the UK. The book was enormously popular. But I got a lot of people asking me to do another Sam Tay novel, so I have mm -hmm. done that. And uh, that's The Umbrella Man. And then uh, next year, there'll be another Jack Shepherd novel. Shepherd continues his. Uh, adventures around Asia now that he's been sort of tossed out of Thailand. He's living in Hong Kong mm -hmm. and uh, is going to get involved in a bit of a scrape in Macau, which I think is a wonderful background for a novel. What advice would you give for aspiring writers? You know, writers get asked that a lot. And, mm -hmm. and 
I, I guess I ought to have some sort of technically correct answer, which really sounds learned, but, but the truth is, the best I can advice I can give anybody is just stand it, sit down and do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nobody who knows if they can do it. No one has ever written a novel who knew how to do it. We all started with nothing. And we started somewhere, and we put another scene in front of that one, and we wrote another scene, and eventually we had a book, and we let some people read it, and then we found out if we could do it. But my experience with a lot of people who talk about writing books is that they love to talk about it. Mm -hmm. They don't actually do the work of, of sitting down, putting their butt in the chair, and getting it done. I mean, I, I, what comes back to me is uh, the only funny thing Richard Nixon ever said, which was when somebody asked him, what does it take to get through law school? And he said, an iron butt. <laughs> and, and I think that's right, mm -hmm. that, that if you want to write, you put your butt in the chair and your fingers on the keyboard, and you just do it. And, and most people who talk about writing a book are never going to do it uh, because they don't have the discipline that it takes to put that butt in a chair and sit down and write the book. And, and I guess the rest of that advice is when you're doing that, you keep going forward. You never look back. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you write a chapter and then you write the next chapter. And you don't go back to read the first chapter and say, oh, geez, that wasn't very good. I need to do that again. If you do that, you'll never finish. Mm -hmm. You just... As John Gregory Dunn said, you dig that ditch, you lay that pipe, it's manual labor, it's craft, it's not inspiration. Uh, it's not that different from practicing law. You show up at the office every day, you do your work, and you go home. That's the best advice I could give anybody.